morning. Can you guys hear me all right? All right. Thanks for coming to Grand Rounds today. And those of you that don't know me, I'm Craig Chai. I'm one of the junior faculty in the Glaucoma Division. And uh, today we're going to be talking about something that's near and dear to my heart. I went into glaucoma for a couple of reasons. One of the main reasons was the opportunity to do international work. And as I've continued to do international work, I've just seen the immense amount of uh, just despair uh, with glaucoma treatment in the developing world. So today, I'm going to present to you this topic, SIS, SICS is to cataract as blank is to glaucoma. And that blank is there for a reason. I don't know what the uh, perfect analogy is to SICS to cataract as something is to glaucoma. But I'm in search of it. And that's what I've kind of committed myself to, and I think this is probably going to be a, a big focus of my career, is to look for a cost-effective solution, a surgical solution, to worldwide open-angle glaucoma. So we're going to get started. I have a few disclosures to make. Uh, I am an investigator for the Hydrus Microsyn, a co-investigator along with Alan Crandall. Uh, Moran is a center, study center for this device for the Hydrus 4 study. And I also own some stock in Abbott. If, you know, I don't think that's really important. <laughs> so glaucoma around the world. You know, the major causes of blindness around the world have steadily changed over the last uh, 100 years. 100 years ago, it was mainly due to corneal disease, such as trachoma. Uh, 50 years ago, much of that was due to cataracts. And presently, a lot of it's due to ARMD. And this is in the developed world. Interestingly, though, things really haven't changed for glaucoma. So glaucoma has been pretty steady in terms of its prevalence around the world, uh, anywhere between 8 to 12 percent in most of the studies that have been published. Uh, people are living longer. Uh, on average, about 10 percent of the population is at risk for developing glaucoma. And again, 50 percent of people are undiagnosed and untreated. So this was a paper published by Quigley back in 2006, looking at the prevalence of glaucoma around the world based on population studies. So here in 2010, you can see that the world glaucoma prevalence was around 44 million. Much of that was in Europe and in China and in India and in Africa in terms of the prevalence and where most of that open angle glaucoma was found. Pushing forward into 2020, we can see that number has increased to about 58,000, or 58 million, I'm sorry. And much of it, again, is centered around Europe, China, India, and Africa. So glaucoma is prevalent, and it is increasing prevalence. Um, let's see. I'm not sure why they didn't include it. This is based, uh, when Quickly did the study, it was based on the studies available at that time. There may have been some studies. Yeah, projections. Yeah, these were based on prevalence models and using UN population. Um, right. So just a little bit of a segue, I wanted to give you an update on the work that Moran has been doing in Haiti. Um, Haiti is the second most populous country in the Caribbean. Cataracts and glaucoma is still the major causes of visual impairment in this part of the world. And we've been focusing our work in the northern part of the country in Cap Haitian, a, a, a city of approximately 250,000 people. Uh, we've been working together with Mike Falmeyer at the University of Nebraska. Uh, and this is our third year that we've been operating in Haiti, working with our local partners. Uh, this is a picture outside of the clinic, our host there. Uh, the name of their clinic is the Vision Plus Clinic, and uh, it's led by Dr. Gerline Roney, Mary Carmel, and Dr. Dupuy. Our team members include some familiar faces. Many of you may rem remember Sonia Dar. Uh, she was a fellow here after me, now practicing in New York City. In addition, Vali Mutapan, our cornea fellow this year, also joined our team, the first time that we brought a cornea specialist uh, on our team. In addition, Joseph Chen, my glaucoma fellow this year, one of my glaucoma fellows, also accompanied us on our, t on our trip. Lisa He is a third year resident from Stanford uh, who's going into retina. She'll be joining uh, the Wilmer <coughs> department next year for her training. And she joined us along this trip as well. Judd Cahoon, one of our MD PhD students, who fresh off defending his dissertation two days later joined us on our trip and was really an instrumental part of our success. Uh, Judd did everything. He was actually the most wanted man in Cap Haitian during this trip. Uh, many times you could hear us calling out for Judd. Uh, in fact, there was one instance where Vali was uh, in the midst of a corneal transplant, and uh, Joe Chen kindly offered some help, and she just said, uh, no, I need Judd right now. <laughs> Judd quickly 
came to the rescue and brought uh, Volley her cornea in order to complete her transplantation. In addition, Lauren Reese is a surgical specialist with Ivantis, a company that produces the Hydrus microstent. Uh, we were fortunate enough to take some of these microstents down and to implant some of the first devices in Haiti. Our team arrived in Port-au-Prince and then we took a small uh, twin prop plane over to uh, Cap Haitian. We had a, a number of different firsts along our trip. Uh, it was the first time that we crammed three operating beds into one room. Uh, we also had the first, uh, this was also the first time that the air conditioning broke. On the first day it was sweltering. Uh, many of us were sweating profusely. Uh, and I can remember vividly one time, Vali was operating with her glasses on and her glasses started to fog up uncontrollably. And she had nothing else to do except to remove her glasses and continue operating without it, did, uh, her did glasses. You get, did you get hand cramps like LeBron James? No, no, ha no <laughs> hand cramps. We were well fueled up. We had our electrolyte uh, okay. juice before ahead of time. Uh, but a number of uh, firsts on our trip. In addition, this was the first time that corneal transplantation had been performed in Capation. And uh, Vali was privileged enough to uh, be able to perform 10 corneal transplantations while we were down there. In addition, this is the first time that I was able to perform the GAP procedure that I was able to uh, learn ahead of time and do down in Haiti. I'll go into a little bit more detail about what the GAP procedure is. In addition, this was the first time that we implanted MIGS devices in Cap Haitian. Uh, this particular device that I'm illustrating here on the left is the Hydrus Microstent, uh, which is the first intracanalicular scaffold. Some of you may also recognize uh, the picture on the bottom right here, which is um, the eye stent produced by Glaucos. In addition, we, this was the first time that we were able to visit the Citadel. The Citadel is the largest fortress established in the Caribbean that was built by the local Haitians to protect them against French invasion. And now let's talk a little bit about glaucoma in this part of the world. There is no Haitian eye study that has been performed yet, uh, but there is the Barbados eye study. The Barbados is an independent country of approximately 280,000 people in the Lower Antilles. And there was a study performed called the Barbados eye study. Uh, back in 1994, the results were published to give us a sense of what the prevalence of open angle glaucoma is like in this part of the world. Around 7% of black uh, citizens of Barbados have open angle glaucoma. Those of mixed background, 3.3%. In addition, what you can see from the study is that the older you are, the higher the prevalence. Um, and also, there seems to be a disproportionate amount of men affected by open angle glaucoma in this part of the world. So glaucoma in Haiti. What are our challenges about glaucoma in Haiti? It's extremely limited in terms of medical therapy and very expensive. Timolol is widely available, and some people have proposed putting it in the water there. Uh, next in line is Travitan. Uh, that's probably our most potent prostaglandin that we have available in Haiti. Uh, but it is considerably expensive and for most of the population is unaffordable. Laser trabeculoplasty is available in parts of Haiti, uh, but is not widely available. And in fact, it's not available at the particular host site where we were working. Uh, and it's very underutilized. There is one SLT machine in Cap Haitian that, has, that is at a local mission, but unfortunately it can only be utilized uh, when the American team comes through that help purchase that machine. So it sits there for most of the year uh, being underutilized. So in general, glaucoma in Haiti is really a surgical problem. But the question that I want to pose today is which surgery? And this could be a question posed to many parts of the world, such as uh, West Africa, where the Moran has been working as well in Ghana. Is it a trap? Is trabeculectomy really our option, our best option, a surgical option for uh, tackling glaucoma in this part of the world? Is it a glaucoma drainage device? Or is it maybe this gap procedure that we'll go into? Or maybe another MIGS device that could possibly address this issue. So what are the alternatives to trabeculectomy? This is a very, very busy slide. Trabeculectomy, for the most part, has been our go-to, our gold standard for glaucoma surgery around the world. But here, this is just a schematic of the different procedures that are available. Uh, this is really the sink of surgery for glaucoma surgery. We can tackle it by inflow options, either using transcleral cycle photocoagulation, ECP. Uh, UC3 is basically using ultrasound technology. Uh, it stands for ultrasound circular cyclocoagulation, uh, pr produced uh, and invented by Malik Kahuk out of Colorado. Uh, cryotherapy really has fallen out of favor because of its uh, collateral damage and extreme pain after treatment. 
Then we can come over here to the right-hand side, uh, looking at trabecular meshwork outflow procedures. And the list is long. Uh, we have the GAP procedure, canaloplasty, uh, revolutionized by Robert Stegman in South Africa, trabectome, also known as ab interno trabeculectomy, the eye stent, uh, second-generation devices such as the eye stent inject, which are in research trials, the hydrous microstent, high-frequency deep sclerectomy, uh, eczema laser trabeculostomy, and SLT and micropulse laser trabeculoplasty. Uh, How about other bypass uh, procedures, such as glaucoma drainage devices? There's also the Zen implant, which is a gel implant that diverts fluid to the subconjunctival space. And finally, another device called the in-focus microshunt, which is also an ab external device that diverts fluid to the subconjunctival space. We also have uveoscleral outflow procedures, such as the Solex gold shunt, uh, the Cypass microstent, as well as the eye stent supra, all diverting fluid into the uveoscleral space. Lots of options, but which one is really going to be our go-to option in the developing world? This remains to be determined. So, in my opinion, I think it's an outflow procedure. <laughs> I really think that in order to tackle this problem, it's going to be an outflow procedure. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one, outflow procedures are physiologic. And number two, outflow procedures, I think, have the greatest potential for being the lowest cost in terms of tackling this problem. So what I want to focus on is this GAP procedure. Some of you have seen a lot of press about this recently. Uh, in this year's Blue Journal, maybe three or four months ago, Ron Feldman's group out of Dallas uh, published their preliminary results that had six-month to 12-month follow-up uh, in their population. But before we get into the GAP, we need to talk a little bit about glaucoma surgery history in general. There are some major milestones uh, that have really propelled glaucoma surgery. Uh, for a while, we've seen just stagnation in glaucoma surgery, but recently, in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a real big renaissance in glaucoma surgery. But back in 1857, von Grave presented at the first International Council on Ophthalmology, and he presented his technique on iridectomy to cure certain types of glaucoma. In, at the beginning of the 20th century, the slit lamp was in invented. Shortly thereafter, Barkin was able to classify open versus closed angle glaucoma. In the 60s, Anthony Maltino out of South Africa introduced the first glaucoma drainage device. Shortly thereafter, Watson introduced trabeculectomy, which has remained uh, largely uh, the gold standard for glaucoma surgery and what most trials have been compared to. In the 70s, we had some uh, innovation in medical therapy. Beta blockers were introduced as medical therapy. In, in the 1990s, Carl Camus was instrumental in developing the pioneering work to propel prostaglandins as one of the major first-line drugs available for, for medical therapy. Now looking a little bit about trabeculotomy history, particularly in 1891, 1891, Dave Vincentis described incision of the iridic angle. And what was interesting about this is that he described this procedure, essentially it was a goniotomy without a goniotomy lens. It was basically a blind procedure in order to incise the angle. In 1936, Barkin, uh, with his innovation of the goniotomy lens, uh, or gonioscopy lens, was able to introduce the goniotomy technique for congenital glaucoma. He published his results in the 40s and reported on 16 out of 17 cases uh, that were successfully treated uh, with goniotomy. Those cases all had primary congenital glaucoma. In the 60s, there were some advancements made uh, in terms of angle surgery. Smith and Burian described tr their trabeculotomy technique simultaneously. Smith was describing a suture technique, and Burian described more of a uh, trabecular tome type technique. Uh, over the time, there have been some refinements in terms of the instrumentation. And here you can see the Harms trabecular tome. Uh, here's the instrument on the left down here. And here you can see the instrument actually in action. Uh, this is an ab external procedure in order to be able to cleave the trabecular meshwork. So, there's been a new renaissance, though, in the last 10 to 15 years, what I'd like to entitle Trabeculotomy 2.0. And really, our friends in Japan take a lot of credit for innovating uh, and really propelling uh, trabeculotomy as a viable technique, not only for pediatric glaucoma, but for a gla gla adult glaucoma as well. So now on to the GAT procedure. Uh, Gonioscopy-assisted transluminal trabeculotomy uh, the technique was reported in the Blue Journal just three or four months ago by Ron Feldman's group. 85 eyes that underwent this procedure. These patients either had primary open-angle glaucoma or secondary open-angle glaucoma. 
It was a single center retrospective non-comparative case series. But what was very powerful was their results. Uh, and these are preliminary results. So I'd be looking at these results further down the line uh, with longer term follow-up. Uh, but with patients with primary open angle glaucoma, their pressures were able to be decreased by 7.7 .7 millimeters mercury at six months and 11.1 .1 at 12 months. Even more powerful were the patients with pseudoexfoliation and pigment dispersion glaucoma uh, with pressure lowering at 17.2 at six months and almost 20 uh, at 12 months follow-up. And there was no effect at all uh, with cataract surgery as they looked at their subgroup analysis. There really was no effect with concurrent cataract surgery. Um, treatment failed in approximately 9% of patients. And why did treatment fail? I think Ron Feldman has really encapsulated why this may be the case. If you don't intervene early in advanced glaucoma, especially if you're going to be operating through the canalicular system and, and going through the uh, trabecular meshwork uh, route, uh, there is a possibility that with advanced glaucoma, the collector channels have already severely atrophied and sclerosed down. So even if you bypass the trabecular meshwork, there may, need, may not be enough functioning collector channels to actually uh, cause or lead to a reduced outflow and, and, and improved intraocular pressure. So I'm going to show you my first GAP procedure done three or four weeks ago with the help of Joseph Chen. And um, we're just going to go through this step by step so you can kind of visualize how this procedure works. Uh, just a note, this is an ab internal procedure. So trabeculotomy, historically, when used for pediatric cases, was done as an ab external procedure. A peritomy was performed, uh, a scleral cut down or a scleral flap, scleral flap was performed in order to identify Schlem's canal, and then a catheter or a probe was used to uh, cannulate Schlem's canal 360 degrees. So this is done through a temple approach. Uh, I've made a paracentesis, and then we'll be injecting some lidocaine. The video is hanging up just a little bit. Viscoelastic is injected into the anterior chamber uh, to maintain that space. And that's one really important thing. Here you can see now I've placed a goniotomy lens on the surface of the eye, and I'm coming in with an MDR blade to incise the angle. I need to basically create a cleft in order to bring my suture in uh, to the canal. And you notice that there is some blood reflux. One of the beauties of this procedure is that as you decompress the eye temporarily at the beginning of the procedure, reflux of blood comes into Schlem's canal and can identify exactly where that trabecular mesh work is and where Schlem's canal is. So after I've created the cleft, I'll come in with a viscoelastic cannula uh, to clear the blood away. And here you can see I'll bring the cannula up into the meshwork where I've just incised it. And I'm blowing some viscoelastic in order to open the lips of the trabecular meshwork. You can see that by the white behind the cannula right there. So after I've identified that, uh, I've used in this procedure the eye track catheter, which is a lighted LED catheter that allows you to be able to follow your catheter <coughs> externally and know where your catheter is at all times. I'm using a micro instrument by MST in order to guide the catheter into the angle. Uh, in just a little bit, you'll see me go in with my micro forcep and grab the end of the suture or grab the end of the catheter. I apologize, the video is just a little bulky and hanging up here. It was supposed to be a lot faster than this. Let's see. All right, there I've grabbed the catheter. That's distal end. And under direct gonioscopy view, I'll be threading that into Schlem's canal. Now this technique is done with the lighted LED catheter, but this procedure can be performed can be performed uh, just with 6O or 4O polypropylene or nylon suture. 
but the LED catheter definitely makes it helpful and easier to cannulate and to be able to visualize, uh, I think, for your first several cases to know exactly where you are in that space. Just push this a little bit forward. And now you can see just continuing, I'm continuing to thread the catheter into Schlem's canal. And blood is actually a good sign in this procedure. It just indicates that you have uh, patency of your collector channels where blood is able to reflux back into the anterior chamber. I've turned off the lights in order to be able to find out where my catheter is. And in this step here, I'll be retrieving the end. The catheter has gone around 360 degrees inside Schlem's canal now. And now this is the portion where I'm actually cleaving the trabecular meshwork. I'm pulling two ends of the catheter now in order to cleave the trabecular meshwork. Ron Feldman's group has done some scanning EM of, uh, of patients or I think uh, of, of research animals and, have, and has found that the cleavage site for the trabecular meshwork is actually at the anterior hinge point. And so what happens is the trabecular meshwork lays down onto the surface of the iris and eventually sneaks there. Here I'm just clearing the microhyphema or hyphema out of the eye. And it's very difficult to see in this video, but uh, intraop on the table, as I've pressurized the eye and increased the pressure into the anterior chamber, that is pushing fluid through the trabecular meshwork, through shelms, through the collector channels, and blanching the episcleral uh, veins. And so that's basically the GAD procedure, gonioscopy-assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. Uh, here's a picture of what it looks like <coughs> gonioscopy-wise, uh, what's described as the trabecular shelf. Uh, that's created right here. This is the iris over here, and again, it cleaves right here at the anterior portion of the trabecular meshwork. Uh, and this membrane will usually lie down on the iris. So what are the advantages of ab internal trabeculotomy? Um, I think there are many, but some of them just to highlight include, it's easier to find Schlem's canal ab internal than ab external. I've done um, some canaloplasty work, which is done ab external, and it is a very rewarding and fun procedure to do, but it is technically challenging in order to be able to consistently find uh, Schlem's canal. And I have found that with the ab internal approach, the reflux of blood into the anterior chamber or into Schlem's canal really helps to identify that landmark easier. It's bloodless. Uh, I personally feel that bloodless surgery is needed in the developing world. Uh, there are difficulties with follow-up, and most of you know that with trabeculectomy, <coughs> The surgery is really not the most difficult part. It's actually the post-operative care in, the, in order to be able to modify scar tissue in order to be able to successfully maintain and bled long term. Uh, it's conjunctival sparing. Uh, rather, trabeculotomy in the, in the past had been done ab external uh, where you did need to violate conjunctiva, uh, but here the conjunctiva is spared. And this allows conjunctiva to be used later if a bypass procedure such as a glaucoma drainage device or trabeculotomy needed, needs to be performed. In addition, I think it's ex inexpensive, although you do have to invest in a goniotomy lens, or you do have to invest in some micro instruments. Uh, these can be reused, uh, and really the only thing that's a consumable item that you need to buy and purchase is viscoelastic and uh, suture. It's physiologic. It really addresses the main site of resistance, what we think is uh, where the main site of resistance is in glaucoma, that's the trabecular meshwork. And it can be performed either 180 degrees or 360 degrees, depending on uh, surgeon preference. And finally, the post-op care is tremendously simple. Um, most of these patients I'm seeing as a typical cataract patient, one day, one week, one month later. And so in terms of the intensity of follow-up where we're seeing patients four to six times weekly, uh, it's in a, um, it has a major advantage of simplifying post-op care. Finally, the hypotony risk is really remote and really boils down to the fact that you have episcleral venous pressure still maintaining pressure in the eye, uh, and that unless the major reason for hypotony would be just leaking wounds after the procedure. So really, hypotony is a very remote risk. Here you can see a device on the bottom right. Uh, this is a new device on the market entitled the TRAB360. It is basically a trabecular tome. It's a device that can go ab internal to cannulate Schlem's canal, and then a provene snare is inside of that that you roll out in order to be able to do a trabeculotomy, either 180 degrees, you can flip it over inside the eye, 
and then do the, under, the other 180 degrees to complete 360 degrees total. What are the disadvantages of ab internal trabeculotomy? It requires a clear cornea, so there may be times when you don't have a clear view. Uh, this can be obvi obviated here in the States with the use of an endoscope, but in the developing world where endoscopes are hard to come by, um, this would be a major problem if you uh, had, did not have a clear cornea. There is a learning curve. Um, there is a learning curve in order to be able to do intra-op gonioscopy, uh, but it is something that is, I think, with practice is easily attainable. You need micro instruments. Uh, these can be expensive, but again, these are reusable items. It's not titratable like a trabeculectomy where you can cut sutures in order to be able to titrate the final pressure as well. Hyphema is a common problem. Uh, of all the, uh, every patient that I've done this procedure on now has had a microhyphema. For some patients, it's been very small. And for other patients, it's been more significant. And a lot of patients, I think, find this disturbing where their vision has decreased after the procedure. But these usually go away within a few weeks. So in conclusion, I don't know what the alternative is to SICS for glaucoma in the developing world, but I'm certainly interested in finding out. Uh, I certainly think that there are challenges to glaucoma care in the developing world, uh, and I, I don't think bleb surgery is the way to go. I do believe that glaucoma dr drainage devices do have a role to play. For example, if you've done a, a gap procedure on a patient and there really has been no response, I think you can safely assume that the normal collector channel system is not working. And in that case, it would probably be prudent to bypass that and a glaucoma drainage device, I think, in the developing world would be the way to go. Oro Lab um, has produced a basically a knockoff of the Bear Velt valve, uh, which I believe is running anywhere between $20 to $30 for a glaucoma drainage device. That is a major improvement in terms of being able to supply glaucoma drainage devices to the developing world. So little by little, we are making progress in terms of tackling glaucoma in the developing world. There's still a lot of progress that needs to be made. Uh, a lot of metrics that need to be measured in order to find out which is the best procedure. And we can basically say that uh, it really depends on the particular population. I think in Asia, where there's a significant amount of angle closure glaucoma, uh, we've seen reduced rates of angle clo closure glaucoma because of FACO and because of cataract surgery. Uh, early intervention seems to keep patients in those parts of the world from developing severe angle closure glaucoma. So with that, if you guys have any questions, we'd be happy to answer those now. Very few. It was mainly an adult population. population. Yeah, where they had the biggest results were in the secondary open angle glaucomas, uh, pigment dispersion and pseudo exfoliation. <coughs>
getting tank ties to the whole population is just as inevitable as part of the process. It's got to be inevitable. It's got to be inevitable. It's got to be an amazing amazing place to work in. So the people are saying, you know, I have been in the place where we try to, you know, even I used to be part of the team. But the place I'm in is called the Lake. How long have you been until the internal device of the design of our national universe started to flow? How are those panning out? So far, pretty well. I mean, there's generally a white population in the model, but it hasn't really been very precise in that sense. It's going to be not that long. It has to be a time cycle and a cycle where you can... And it's certainly a cycle where you can do it. It's certainly not time and frame. Twelve percent of the total of local research is that. So, I mean, one major is the supply. Yeah, and it's not, you know... And it's a tough glaucoma, too. Very tough, yeah. It's a malignant type of glaucoma. Those of you that have traveled down there with me, it's routine for us to see patients in their 30s and 40s uh, with pressures in 50s, uh, with cupped out nerves and already unilaterally blind in one eye. A very devastating type of glaucoma. You know, I haven't seen a lot of 2020 patients down in Haiti with glaucoma. <laughs> uh, oftentimes, their hand motion, LP, uh, 2080, 2060. It, it, we're once in a while, we're surprised that we have a patient that's 2020, but that's usually just in one eye. Uh, and you know, obviously, we're in a referral center uh, where we're seeing the worst of the worst. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of glaucoma out there that is undetected and untreated. Um, and I think that's an important part to talk about with tackling glaucoma in the developing world. Uh, we not only need a surgical solution, but it needs to be a major public health campaign to identify patients early, uh, to promote screening, um, and to get people in early. Because I think with a lot of these procedures, um, if you don't intervene early enough, um, it doesn't really matter what happens. Uh, and, and then you're left with you know, options like trabeculectomy or glaucoma drainage device. But if we're gonna try to do a physiologic type procedure, either using a MIGS device or a canal-based procedure like the GAT procedure, I really feel like you need to do it early on while collector channels are still flowing. Yeah, I think the best way, the best way to really get through it is probably, you know, look at each country. In their study, we didn't see the work of Ohio, but it's really also probably going to be a, if you're going to get a one-stop surgery, it would be either Ohio or Paris would be easier than the United States or even like the Southern Union in Boston. So if you're going to be trying to try to stop the brain,
something happens to those animals in the catalog, then they want to go find them. Then, then, then you can get a piece of it. Then you get a piece of that. You get the lower the pressure, and you get the And they're machine better, so they're printing better. So all of a sudden, they switch around and count fingers off. So anything that we can do also about the calculation is if we can preserve a grid in society, if we can do, we don't have to drop the curve. We don't have to do that. Just a little thing about MIGS devices. I think some of you are interested in, in expanding your repertoire and using MIGS devices like the iStent. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism, I think, of using a single iStent uh, with <coughs> mixed results. Um, I, in my own personal experience, I haven't done very many uh, of the iStent, maybe 10 or so patients. And some of them have been home runs and some of them have been duds. Uh, and I think that really boils down to where you're placing that stent. If it's close to a functioning area, close to a collector channel that's still working, I think you'll see some decent results. One of the beauties of the Hydrus Microstent, it's really like an eye stent, as Alan likes to call it, a, a eye stent on steroids. You're, you're, you're recruiting three clock hours uh, worth of collector channels with one device. Uh, and in my limited experience using that device, I've seen some very profound drops in IOP. Uh, Alan, probably you too, but like 40, 50% drops in IOP uh, just with a single Hydrus stent. Uh, and that's as a standalone procedure without cataract surgery. So, Case was. Thank you. 